Let's six. Let's start, right? Hi, everybody. Yep. Welcome to the Lean Talk. Uh, uh, Sebastian and I are going to present Lean 4, uh, uh, some new features, and make some demos of Lean 4. Uh, uh, what's Lean, right? The, the main goals right now, it, it keeps changing, right? Uh, Lean is a proof assistant, but uh, in Lean 4, we want you to make it uh, a programming language too. The main goals are extensibility, expressivity, scalability, proof stability, and we want also want now an efficient a functional programming language. We want Lean to be a platform for developing custom automation in domain-specific languages, uh, also a platform for software unification and formalizes mathematics. Lean is based on dependence type theory, uh, we, 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 we focus on the De Bruyne principle, right? So we have a small trusted kernel. Uh, we have external proof and type checkers. We have the capability of exporting our developments. This is useful not just for uh, being able to write external proof checkers, but also for exporting. For instance, uh, I think Gabriel is here in the talk. I mean, he wrote a tool that exports the link uh, 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 the mathlib. These are big developments using uh, the previous version of Lean. Uh, it exported to Lean 4, right? And so having this capability of exporting your developments is useful not just for uh, being able to check your developments using external type checker. Uh, there are many resources if you are interested in, in learning more about Lean. We, we, I'm going to go over the, some of them uh, after I finish these slides. We have the websites, we have an online tutorial, the Zulip channel where uh, people exchange messages and ask questions about Lean. I also have here the community website. Uh, uh, the community maintains official release, that is Lean 3. Uh, I'm also adding the link to MathLib here uh, and the link for repository. Uh, MathLib is a mathematical library developed uh, by the community. Uh, there are many, many uh, contributors. I have a link here where you can find the, the complete list. Uh, they have a paper. And I have some outdated statistics. Uh, this morning I checked it. Uh, I think it's already 300, almost 300,000 lines of code, MathLib. But this is not shot of uh, the mid of May, uh, something like that. Uh, extensibility. Link tree users use Link to extend itself, right? There are many examples of, of uh, extensions they wrote, like the Ring Solver. Uh, they add support for co-inductive predicates, uh, attached for transferring data, uh, transferring uh, terms from one structure to another. Uh, they have written a position prover, linters, uh, decision procedures like for remote scheme, omega for linear integer arithmetic, and many more. Uh, the key idea here is that we want to allow uh, users to ac access internals of the system, like the type inference, the unifier, the simplifier, decision procedures, and so on. Uh, before I continue, uh, uh, please feel free to interrupt uh, Sebastian and I whenever you want. Uh, uh, we didn't lock, uh, we didn't mute anybody. If you want to unmute and ask questions, please feel free to do it. Uh, I, I try to list some, some applications of, of Lean. Uh, we have the Formal Abstracts project by Tom, led by Tom Hales, Fly Pitch by Jesse Hamm and Flores Van Duren, the Lean Perfectoid Spaces, uh, the Lean Forwards, uh, the IMO, IMO Grand Challenge being developed by Daniel Selson, and there are many others, like the CertiGrad project that uh, verified machine learning. IV Meta Theory by Ken McMillan, Alive in Lean by Nuno Lopez, Protocol Verification Project by Galois, a SQL Query Verification by the University of Washington. Lean is also very popular in education. Uh, and last ATP, there were six papers about Lean. 
Uh, some, uh, why were developing Lean 4, right? Uh, they just to make the system more extensible. Right now, people uh, write uh, automation in Lean. Uh, they can, they, but they have very limited uh, support for mutation. Uh, also for when you write uh, uh, automation in Lean, like a superposition prover, uh, Lean 3 is just an interpreter. There's no support for compiled code. Uh, and so uh, performance is an issue, right? Uh, and you can write automation, but you cannot extend uh, arbitrary parts of the system like the elaborator, right? Another limitation is that trace messages are just strings, right? Sometimes it's useful to have it as a data structure that you can browse and inspect and traverse, right? With Lean 4, we want to address all these limitations. Uh, we are also implementing Lean Lean. Uh, uh, all major subsystems are going to be implemented in Lean. Uh, for instance, we, the parse is already implemented in Lean, the elaborator, compiler, tactics, the formatter. We have a hygienic macro system. Uh, we have structured tra uh, trace messages. And only the base, uh, right now we still have uh, Few, a few parts written in C and C++, but the, the, the goal in the end is to have just the runtime and the basic primitives implemented in C. In Lean Fork, we also have a foreign function interface. Uh, we have a, a, a runtime that supports boxes and unboxes data for performance reasons. Uh, the runtime uses reference counting and it can perform strict updates when the reference counter uh, is one. This, there's only one, the only one owner for the objects. The, the code generator will generate code that performs such updates in this case. Our compiler generates C code, but one important thing is that we can mix byte code with the compiled code. For instance, when you're writing code that there is no compiled co version of it, uh, we're going to use the interpreter, but if in the in the middle of the bytecode, you call something that we already have compiled code, it switches to compiled. Users can use plugins, they can uh, write some packaging link. Uh, from this package, they can generate C code, uh, pack everything as a plugin that's a shared library that can be dynamically linked to me. In this way, all this automation that I described before, like a uh, ring solver, a uh, superposition. Uh, prover can all be implemented in Lean. The user can compile that uh, in C, pack everything as, as a plugin and dynamically loads to the, into the system. We also want to allow users to, to use low level tricks. We use, when we're implementing Lean 4, we use several low level tricks. Uh, another goal for Lean 4 is to choose proofs, not just for making sure your code is correct, but allowing you to get better performance, to improve the performance of the generated code. Uh, uh, this is an example of an indexed data type. Uh, this is an indexed data type representing Lean expressions, right? Uh, is that Lean, uh, in Lean 3, this, we had a similar object, but it was just a wrapper for something that was implemented in C, C++, right? Now this is really a, 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 a Lean object. And here's a function, it's just an example of a, a, a Lean function that's manipulating these expressions, right? Uh, I, I will go during the demo, I will show many other functions. This is just to give an idea that uh, or how we are writing things in Lean, uh, how we are writing Lean in Lean itself. Uh, to, to write Lean, Lean is based on the calculus of inductive constructions, uh, but uh, in CIC all functions are total, but to implement Lean, Lean, we also want general recursion, we want foreign functions, we want unsafe features like pointer equality for performance reasons. Uh, to achieve that, the first step we did is to have a, a keyword called unsafe. This is very close to the meta keywords in Lean 3. Uh, what's the main difference? When you use the unsafe keyword, right? A if a function is unsafe, it doesn't need to terminate. You don't, you don't need to show it 
uh, you can have a general recursion when uh, for unsafe functions. Uh, unsafe functions may use unsafe type casting, like, like in C, right? Uh, but there is a, a detail. I mean, regular functions cannot call unsafe functions, right? So we don't want to allow people to prove false. Uh, terms are regular functions, they are not unsafe, right? And uh, as I said, uh, having this mechanism, the main goal is to make sure that you cannot prove false in Lean, right? Uh, terms proving Lean 4, we want them to be able, we want to be able to check them with reference type checkers. Uh, we don't even, uh, the, the reference type checkers are going to ignore unsafe functions, right? But uh, we want a compromise, right? We want to be able to provide an unsafe version for any opaque function whose type is inhabited. What do I mean by that? Uh, in Lean 4, we changed a little bit uh, the, the semantics of the constant primitive. Uh, in, in, in Lean 3, a constant uh, is, is an axiom, right? In Lean 4, a constant is not an axiom anymore, right? It's an opaque definition, right? For instance, here I'm giving an example of this mix hash 64, right? Uh, uh, the, uh, here I'm saying that is the is returning zero everywhere, but with the external uh, uh, annotation here, I'm, st I'm telling the compiler to replace this implementation, right? That is opaque to the system, right? Nobody, uh, you can prove that mix hash of any two values is zero, right? Uh, you can't prove anything about this, this constants. Uh, but what I'm telling the compiler is to replace its implementation with this uh, function implemented in, in C called lean underscore lean 64 mix hash. This is the first capability, right? Uh, we can, for opaque constants, we can tell them to, we can tell the compiler to replace them with a C function. But more importantly, we can seal unsafe features. Here I have a, a, a function called set state unsafe that uses an unsafe cast, right? Uh, this, uh, because I'm using unsafe cast, I have to tag this function as unsafe. But now we want to seal it. I want to provide a safe version called set state, right? I'm going to give a default uh, 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 implementation for set states. Uh, I'm just going to return the environment, right? I'm showing that this function, uh, uh, the type of this constant set states is inhabited, right? Uh, but it's opaque, you cannot prove anything about this constant. But we, now we are telling that to the compiler, use the unsafe implementation, right? Uh, when you use this trick, you may generate code that will crash, right? The same way when in Rust or, or, or you use an unsafe feature, you may crash the, uh, you may have a runtime error, right? But the compromise here is that you cannot prove false, in me, right? You may, you, your code, that if you're not careful here, what may happen is that, you, for instance, your unsafe cast is not valid at runtime, you may crash the system, but, uh, you don't compromise the logical soundness of the system. Uh, the partial keywords, right? A general recursion is a major convenience, right? Uh, one trick in a system uh, that supports only total functions to use a few arguments, right? You have uh, extra arguments, that's the maximum number of steps, but this is inconvenient uh, and you have to keep dealing with this few all, all over the place. Uh, sometimes you, your function terminates, but you don't want to waste time proving it to terminate. And sometimes uh, it's not strong enough to, to, to prove it, right? Uh, the partial key, what can be implemented by just combining the unsafe with implemented by idiom, right? Uh, in the future, uh, our goal is to uh, even allow users to, by using metaprogramming, you can prove later determination. You have, you, you introduce a function as partial, 
right? Use the unsafe implements by trick. Your, your function in the system now is opaque. Later, you can use metaprogramming to create a new version with a proof of termination that's not opaque, right? Uh, proofs for performance and profits. Uh, we want to use proofs not just for, for, uh, for proving properties of our programs, but also for getting more efficient codes. Here we have a version, uh, a very simple function for returning the elements of an array. This is, you're going to find most systems on dependence uh, types, you're going to find a function like that, right? That you have an array A, an index I, and you, you are here providing a proof that I is less than the size of the array, right? Uh, this is pretty standard, but there's now a feature that's not standard. Uh, it's like pointer equality. Here we have this, uh, this, uh, this function with pointer EQ that I'm going to show later how it's implemented. But the idea is simple. You have X and Y at two values, and you have a computation that returns a Boolean, right? Uh, and a proof that if X equals Y, this computation K will return true, right? Uh, the reference implementation here of, with pointer EQ just executes the continuation, doesn't care about X and Y. But uh, uh, what, Sebastian? Yes. Yeah, I'm assuming I got a message saying that I had been kicked out. <laughs> uh, you're still here for me. Okay. You're still cool. here. Yes. Good. Yeah. Everything yes. is good. I think. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this point that he quite, but the, the, the actual code that's generated is we check the address of X and Y. If they are the same, we return true, otherwise we execute the continuation. <coughs> the, this unsafe implementation is relying on the fact that in our runtime, if two objects have the same address, they are structurally equal, then uh, for sure uh, the, the computation K would have returned true then we're just short circuiting. Uh, uh, we, we're skipping K, but we're not changing the meaning of the program. Uh, we, we uh, as I said before, our runtime uses reference counting. Uh, there are many reasons we decide to use reference counting, right? Uh, it's simple to implement, it's easy to support multi threading, right? <coughs> We, you can perform the structure updates when the reference counter is one. This is a no optimization for big objects like arrays, other programming languages implemented this, this optimization. But in our compiler, we demonstrated that this is also relevant for small objects. Uh, keep in mind that in languages like Coq and Lean that are based on CIC, we do not have cycles. So this uh, reference counting is not, it's not a problem uh, being uh, for us. And another advantage of using reference counting that is easy to interface with C, C++, Rust. I put a link to, uh, uh, to a paper that Sebastian and I wrote describing uh, how we compile Lean, uh, Lean programs using this approach. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, these slides are available on the Lean website. Right, uh, and so you can download uh, these slides uh, if you want. Yeah, I'll post a link in the chat. Cool. Uh, our implementation relies on something that we call uh, the resurrection hypothesis. Is that uh, tracing regular standard tracing GCs? They have a, a hypothesis that they believe that most objects die uh, young, right? Here, in the resurrection hypothesis, we add a new twist. Uh, we believe that many objects die young and they also die close to the creation of uh, an object of the same kind. Here are many examples that demonstrate this hypothesis, like list map. <coughs> if the list A here, right, you have a list and a function, you're going to apply the function to the elements of the list. If the input list is uh, the reference counter to the input list is one, right? You are going to traverse it, and as you are traversing it, you are deleting it and create a new list of Bs, right? 
Our compiler in this case is going to reuse the memory cells of the list. Compilers apply transformations to expressions, right? Same thing, you're traversing an expression and applying transformations to it, and you're probably deleting the old one and creating a new one, right? <coughs> Similarly, proof assistance free writes and simplify formulas, right? Same thing, they're traversing a formula, and as it's doing it, it's, uh, the, the previous one is being garbage collected and the new one is being created. And uh, in our compiler, we're going to reuse these memory cells automatically. Uh, and it's also useful for the, uh, functional data structures like red black trees. For instance, in our insert procedure for a red black tree, uh, in a heavy functional programming language, when you insert an element in the tree, you're going to traverse the tree, the whole spine of the tree will have to be reconstructed, right? <coughs> If the tree is not shared, there's only one, the reference counter of the tree is one, and the, uh, and the nodes of the tree that have been uh, in this path are all one. What's going to happen? In Lean, we're going to create only one new node, the node for the new elements that you inserted. Another example is the list, list zipper also, right? Uh, a zipper is a pair of lists, right? And again, we are going to despair here. The reference counter is going to be one most of the time, right? The resurrection hypothesis will hold for this kind of, uh, of data structure. It's also allowed, I mean, this, uh, uh, having reference counting also allows us to write code that we would never write in a pure language. For instance, the, the passing states in our implementation has an array of, uh, I stack, that's an array of syntax objects. And you have functions like push syntax, right? That you get a state, a syntax, and you return a new state, right? Here, you, you are passing state is an object with four uh, slots, right? Four fields. And here, we are reusing the parsing states and reusing also the array that is nested inside if the reference counter of this object is one. Right. Uh, it is in a pure language. If you didn't have this reuse behind the scenes, what would happen is you'd have to allocate, copy the uh, the uh, array syntax, right? Or you would not use an array; you'd use a list instead, right? To avoid all this copying. But here, uh, the structure updates are happening. Uh, behind the scenes and you don't have to do anything special to get to get these instructions to base. I tried to summarize the main points before uh, we're implementing Lean Lean. They just allow all uh, modules of the system to be customized by users. But it's one feature that we're using is the ceiling and safe features we're using all over the place. <laughs> our compiler generates codes and you can we can mix compiled and interpreted code. I will demo that Sebastian and I were going to demo these features. Uh, our compiler shows also that it's feasible to implement a functional language using reference counting. And we, we believe that we barely scratch the surface of this design space of using reference counting. All the source code is available on the Lean4 repository. Now I, I'm going to uh, and share my screen uh, and try to show. Uh, uh, let's see, show a few uh, web pages. It's, where is okay? Okay. Sebastian, can you see the Lean Web site? Um, I'm still seeing the slides in Keynote. Oh, let's just see. Let me see. <coughs> Can you see now? Yes, yes. Okay. Just the leanprover.github.io is the Lean website. Uh, we have, uh, if you go to documentation, online tutorial, you have a, a tutorial, but actually this is a tutorial for Lean 3. One nice thing about this tutorial that is interactive, for instance, if I go to tactics, 
Uh, you have many examples and you can click try it. You can play with the examples in your editor. Uh, this is very similar to, you, you can even step over uh, a text. You can see uh, after you apply it, like a text like intro, you can see what happens. Uh, another relevance uh, website is the link for all the source codes for link for is there. Uh, a tool that's really important is, uh, is really handy if you're using link three and link four at the same time is a tool that Sebastian built called Elan. Uh, <coughs> it, it, it's like it allows you to manage different installations of link. Uh, and for developing Lean 4, also it's handy because uh, we have two versions of Lean 4 usually running, right? The, the stable one that we're using to compile Lean 4 and in the one that we, the latest Lean 4 that we compiled using the stable Lean 4, right? And we use Elan to manage these different versions. Another interesting website, if you're interested in Lean, is the Lean community. Uh, as I said, they, uh, the, the community maintains Linktree, the official release. You can download it from this website. Uh, you, 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 the, the mathematical library, the statistics about the mathematical, the Lean MathLib, uh, you can find in this website. For instance, here, as I said, uh, number of lines of code is almost 300,000 now. Another uh, interesting uh, 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 website is the Lean Zulips channel. Uh, the channel, uh, yeah, is pretty active. Uh, I, I think the last time I went to the channel was like a few weeks ago. It's already 12,000 messages there. Uh, yeah, these are the, the, the links I want to show. Uh, they are good resources if you're interested in learning more about Lean. Uh, now I'm going to switch to the actual demo. Uh, let me share my Emacs. Uh, Sebastian, can you see the Emacs? Yeah, looks good. Yeah, cool. cool. Uh, the command checking link returns the type. For instance, here I have the string hello. If I ask check hello, you're going to say hello is a, a string. You, you see the result in, on the bottom of your email, of my Emacs here, right? Uh, check one, one's a net. Uh, we have functions. For instance, here's a function that gets, giving a, a natural number, it turns, uh, natural number x, it turns x plus one, right? Uh, if you ask the type, it's a function from net to net. Uh, here we have the eval command for evaluating. Uh, uh, basically, here you have a function application, right? So applying this function to the arm tree. If I eval, I get four back, right? The result is here on the bottom of the screen. Uh, eval is going to use interp the interpreter. But if, as I said, if you have, if you're calling a function that has compiled codes, it will use it. We have here the factorial function defined by pattern matching, right? Uh, zero return one. If it's, it's n plus one, we, we want to return n plus one times factorial of n. Uh, if we evolve fact, factorial four, you get 24 as expected, and factorial of 20, you have this big number here. Uh, in Lean, we have this, uh, uh, we use the dots notation for uh, before showing that notation, let me show one example of the list map. I have, we have this function list map as, as many functional programming languages. I'm providing here the function uh, that's uh, giving a natural number and converts it into a string and applying it to the list one, two, three. If we evaluate uh, this piece of code, you get the list of strings one, two, three. Uh, Sorry, uh, there was one question if you could make the bottom bigger, the evaluation area, or move to the side. I think if you open the flight check error list, that may help. Okay. Uh, check. Uh, just that? 
Um, like check in no, no, I think that will no? change the mode of the current file. Um, so okay. you want to go back to the inform mode. Um, yes. I think it's, um, I don't remember quite right now, is it control C explanation mark L or something like that? Oh yeah, it is, nice. Um, okay, but so I think, yeah, I think the fly check mode has changed something. Uh, you yes, may want to reopen the yeah. Button. Oops. You just increase the font, I guess. Okay, I think now it's not it's work. Yeah. Uh, I opened another window. Um, ah. The list is gone again. Okay. Now I think okay. I can. Yeah, and it's maybe you out, can. Right? Yeah, yeah, but maybe you can also increase the font just a bit. Uh, okay, let's see. Not sure how. So oh yeah. Good, right? Not too much. Yeah, I think this should be good. Yes. Uh, true string here is a polymorphic uh, function. Uh, uh, and now it's the dot notation. The dot notation link allows us to, uh, it works the following way. Suppose here I have a list, one, two, three, it has type list. Right. When I write dots map, the elaborator, what it's going to do is, it's going to infer the type of this value here, one, two, three, that's list, and you look in the environment for something called list dots map. If there is one, it will use it. That's the, how this dots notation in Lean uh, works. And this is quite handy. For, for writing really compact codes. And users can extend, for instance, if you want to write, uh, a lot, you want to be able to write a function, land one and use it uh, with the dot notation. We just define list dot land one, right? That returns the length of the list plus one. And now I can write one, two, three dot land one. And we get here the value four, right? The length of the tree the, of the list is three, plus one, four, right? Index data types in Lean. Here's an example of index data type, right? You have a leaf that has a, a value of type alpha, and you have a node that has two trees, right? Uh, nodes are constructor that takes two trees and it returns a, a tree, right? Now, uh, I'm defining here the true string for, for tree alpha, right? The square brackets here uh, tells us is a type uh, how the system should synthesize these implicit arguments, right? You have the first implicit argument is alpha, is a type, and you have a has tree string that is uh, an instance of the type class has tree string, right? Uh, basically saying that the type alpha should have an uh, instance of this type class called has tree string. And then I, I'm going to write a function that's giving a tree, it turns a string. If it's a leaf, it just converts the leaf is a type alpha. I'm just going to call true string for it, right? I'm using this, basically what's happening, I'm using this, this implicit argument here to convert the value A into a string. And if it's a constructor node left, right, I'm just going to do uh, create a string nodes with calling recursively to str. And the command uh, 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 instance allows us to define a new, uh, see if I can increase a little, okay. Basically here, I define a new instance for the type tree alpha. Basically, I'm saying here is that if alpha has an instance, if you have an instance has to string alpha, then 
tree alpha, we also have an instance has to string uh, tree alpha, right? And here's how this is the function that converts tree alpha into a string. Right? After we define this instance, we can call tree string, right? On a, a, it's not, let's see. Oh, here you can see the results. Nose 1020, right? I have here a tree. I'm constructing a tree with leaves 10 and 20. And if I call tree string on this tree, I get nodes 1020 as expected, right? We can uh, we have namespaces in link, right? We have here the tree namespace. And we can call tree string now on trees. Right. Uh, if I open, uh, sorry, if you open the namespace tree, now we don't need to write tree dot nodes, tree dot leaf, and so on. Right. Uh, uh, here to string, uh, I'm creating a list, uh, a tree with the leaves 10, 20, and 30. And you, here you convert it to string, the result is expected. In four, we have arrays. Uh, this is the notation for creating array literals. And they, they have all the same, they have all, all the usual functions you expect in an array library, like map, you can update uh, an array position using set. The set bank version here is that we don't, we're not providing a proof. So if the index one is not a valid index, you return the same array, right? Uh, we have also a version, <coughs> this version here has a runtime check that's going to check the index you're providing is smaller than the size of the array. And you have a version set that you have to provide a proof that the index is less than the, the, the size of the array. We have push for adding elements of the array. And <coughs> as I said before, uh, all uh, if the array is ex exclusive, all the updates are going to be performed destructively. In link 4, uh, in link 3.2, we have strings, we have structures, uh, structures that have many fields here, have a field name and a field called age, but the age has a default value. Uh, we specify here the default value is zero. Here I'm defining an instance for, for has to string for person, right? That just prints the name and the, and, and the age. It just concatenates the name and the age. Here uh, we're converting uh, I, we are sh I'm showing the, how you, the structure, uh, how you create the structure instances, elements of this type person, right? Here I'm saying that it's a person because uh, we don't, uh, there's no way for the system to infer what's the, the, the kind of structure you're trying to create. This way we're saying it's a person uh, here. Here's the same example where I did not provide the age and the default value is users that is zero. Suppose that I put here 10, you go here, you get check has age 10, right? Because it, uh, I just changed the default value when it's not provided. Here's a, a function called ink age. That's giving a person an uh, M, it, it does a new person with the age updated. Uh, the system here knows that ink age is expecting a person. Note here, I don't have to write a person here because the system knows that you are trying to provide ink age expects a person. You don't have to say which, what kind of structure you're trying to create a value of. We have IO meaning, right? Here's a small example where we are just printing hello world. Uh, and the message you provided, we provided. Uh, here we get the output, hello world, and, and then we are printing full. Uh, we have debugging uh, helper functions, for instance, the tree map here, I wrote the, the, the standard tree map function to just apply F to the, L, to the values in this tree. And suppose here that I, I have, I create a, a node uh, I create a tree if the if the value is 10, 20, and 30. Uh, and I, I map, I apply map, that's I'm incrementing the values of, of this 
tree, right? If I evaluate, I get a, a tree with the no, with the, the values 11, 21, and 31. But suppose that I, I want to print the values of the elements that we are visiting. We have this debug trace primitive that's just for debugging, right? It's before executing debug trace basically if you see, if you see the type of debug trace you're going to see that it gets a value of type alpha uh, it gets a string and gets something that returns alpha a, a continuation f that returns a alpha right what it does is it prints s in the sense output the sense error uh, uh, and executes f right uh, this is very handy for debugging Right, links a strict language. So, uh, uh, this bug trace behaves like we expect, right? So we are mapping uh, and basically I'm printing the, the value of the elements of the tree that we are visiting when we perform map, right? Uh, we are, we are, I, I had many demos, but uh, Sebastian has a much cooler demo. So I'm going to finish just showing how I'm going to show uh, one extra demo showing how we see uh, uh, unsafe features, right? And I have here an example of uh, a, a map for array, for arrays. But in this example here, uh, let's just increase a little bit the screen. Uh, I, before I show this, this unsafe version, let me show you the, the safe version. Uh, I'm going to implement a map using the fold L, right? Then I get an array AS, I'm going to fold over it. Uh, 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 we're producing a new array of betas by applying the function F. Basically, I'm just going to keep pushing the elements F, uh, A of the array AS into B after I apply the function F, starting from the empty array. Uh, this reference implementation here is going to create a new array, even if the input array, the reference counter is one. Suppose that we want it to, to do it destructively. This can be done in lean, even if alpha and beta have different types. Uh, because our runtime arrays, this, this kind of array is always an array of pointers or boxes, uh, 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 scalars, right? In this way, we know the, the shape of an, any array alpha is identical to the shape of array beta. But we know that the runtime has this property. And you can try to exploit this property using unsafe features to obtain a uh, uh, a more efficient version. Here I'm using this, uh, I wrote this new map, the unsafe map, right? That's going to traverse an array A, right? Of type non-scalar and produce a new array non-scalar. But this version here, the short updates can be uh, executed. Uh, here there's also this debugging primitive that prints the message array if the array A is shared, right? The reference counter is greater than one. And the implementation is quite simple. We get the current position of the array. Uh, we, we store in the array some arbitrary value, right? We do that because we want to take the ownership of the elements that was stored in the array. We want to make sure if the, if the array was the only data structure pointing to this value now, <coughs> a is the only, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, V is going to be pointing to this, uh, will be this, the only reference to this value. <coughs> Here we use an unsafe cast because V is a non scalar, but F expects alpha, then we use unsafe cast. Then we use us, we get a new value, new V and we update the array with this new value using unsafe cast again, because new V is a beta, but there it will have an array of non-scalers. Uh, when we finish the traverse, we return A. What happens here is that if the array 
A now, the reference counter is one, we're going to perform the structure updates all over the place. Uh, here, uh, I have a test to one function where I'm converting the array one to three into a string, right? If I execute it, we see val one, val two, val three, right? Uh, let's see if I... Um, Uh, here I have the, uh, a, a, a similar example where I have an array one, two, three, but it's used it twice. It's where the first time we call map, the array is still shared because there is a live reference to XS being used here. It's where you're going to sh see the message shares RC here, right? When, you when we execute that's true, you're going to see that there's uh, we get this message because I added this debug trace here. But notice that uh, only one structure update is happening, right? This, this piece of code here is executed three times because the array has size three. Only the first time you perform a structure update is because as soon as you perform the first structure update, is, you are now you create a new fresh array with reference counter one. And the next in the next iteration, the array is exclusive. This is one thing that you observe it. Even when uh, things are shared in Lean, they quickly become unshared and, this, and you, you start doing the shift updates. Uh, this is quite handy when, for instance, in, in Lean 4, we have something called a persistent array that is a, this is like in Scala or, or, or or closure where persistence arrays are like these trees that the nodes are really big. They have like 32 children, right? And so they are arrays. And, and so this persistence arrays means we exploit this, this structure update. You have these trees, but if the persistence array the reference counter is one, we perform the structure updates. Uh, now I'm going to stop. Uh, Sebastian now is going to, to make a much cooler demo, demonstrating some uh, features uh, that we have implemented in Link 4. Can you? Okay. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, you. So I'll try sharing my screen now. Sorry, quick question. Uh, yeah. In multiple instances, maybe in different namespaces for type classes. Yeah, in general, uh, type class instances can overlap and we're not doing any uniqueness checks at all, um, which would be much harder than in, say, Haskell. Um, so yeah, we are we are using the first instance we can find. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, okay, so I hope you can see my Emacs now. Is that working? Yes. Please? Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, font size is okay as well. Um, yeah, so you've heard, already heard from you that Lean is supposed to be completely extensible, which includes um, the new front end we've completely rewritten in Lean. Um, and by front end, I mean the parser and the elaborator. Um, and yeah, Leo has told you that you can now really embed your very own domain specific language in Lean 4. So let's take a look at uh, what that can look like in practice. So first things first, um, you can see we're using the new front end because it says so right here. So we're not using it yet by default because it's not completely finished yet, but as we'll see, uh, we can already use it for some very interesting things as soon as we activate it. Um, so I tried to think of a very simple DSL, so domain specific language, um, I could show off here that people maybe still actually use in practice. And so the first thing that came to my mind was this um, JSX extension of JavaScript where you can um, embed um, HTML in your, um, directly in your code. So yeah, it would be interesting if we like, could just write some HTML code in Lean and it would say, uh, interpret that as a string. 
Um, so yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. So I'm using the eval command again, um, just like you. And on the right hand side, you can see the output, which is the HTML content essay string. Of course, you may um, actually want to use the um, the, the actual structure of the HTML elements here, but yeah, let's start small for this demo. And yeah, this is still not very interesting, I think, because it's literally just outputting what I in, um, wrote here. So let's make this a bit more dynamic. I'll introduce a regular variable here, and just like in JSX, I can then um, add a placeholder here um, that accepts any lean term of type string and will simply inject its value into the result as you can again see on the right hand side. Okay, um, yeah, so that's the very basics of our very simple DSL. We can of course also um, nest elements, we also support self-closing elements just like JSX um, using this closing slash um, for simpler parsing, but in the um, in the output on the right hand side, the slash is actually gone, just like it's customary in actual HTML. And uh, we're actually doing at least a bit of static checks here. So if you say uh, completely mistype a closing tag, the DSL will actually uh, throw an error and say, yeah, that's not the closing tag I expected here. Okay, so how can you implement something like that yourself in Lean? So nothing of this, of course, is built in. It's all in this uh, code block I've hidden so far. And well, I've uh, still hidden some uh, more uh, minor details, but let's look at the bigger picture here. Um, so the first thing we're doing is we're declaring two new syntax categories called element and child for an HTML element and the child of an HTML element. And you can think of a syntax category as like an open set of parsers that you can extend at any point in time in any file. And that's exactly what we're doing below. We're saying there, um, here's two new syntaxes in the element category, one for the uh, self-closing element, which is an ident between the uh, create small less than sign and the slash greater than. And then of course a, a normal element with zero or more children as denoted by this star after the child category. So these are now two valid syntaxes for the element category and we are um, in the background, we're synthesizing parsers um, according to this specification. So at this point, the child category is still empty of course, but that's not an issue because it will actually use dynamically use um, all the available parsers at runtime in this category. So yeah, let's next uh, fill up that category. So what is a valid child in HTML? Well, it could be arbitrary raw text, which can be almost any character except for a few ones like um, angle and uh, curly brackets. And um, alternatively, it can be a placeholder that is a curly brace um, uh, surrounding an arbitrary mean term. So here the term um, parser, that is actually the built-in uh, syntax category for, uh, for valid lean terms. And of course, um, recursively, any HTML element is also a valid child of an HTML element. So there's actually some mutual recursion here between the two syntax categories, um, but that's not an issue because we're not assuming that parsers are total or anything like that anyway. So we just accept that. And finally, of course, we have to connect that to the existing Lean grammar. So we say any HTML element is now also a valid Lean term as we've seen below in the example. And that already describes our um, entire uh, grammar of our DSL, except for the text parser, which I've hidden here, um, which since it's um, so at, at the low level actually working character and character. This is uh, not using the syntax DSL, but using actually lean code and def uh, defining a 
value of this type parser. And well, you can, um, like, let's not look at the details, but you can at least see that we're calling a take while function here, which apparently eats up characters as long as this predicate is fulfilled, i.e. as long as they are not in this set of other characters. And that's how we're um, parsing the raw text in our very simple DSL. All right, so that's the syntactic part of the DSL, but of course we also have to give it some semantics. And we're doing this um, down here using the macro root statement, which um, simply gives um, syntax translation rules for one or more um, yeah, syntax definitions. So we're saying here inside a uh, quotation, whenever you see the syntax for a self-closing element um, and we are matching the, the tag of the name of the element um, uh, using this uh, dollar anti quotation to the name n, whenever you see this structure in, in, the, in the syntax tree translated to the right-hand side, and what the right-hand side does is it returns a new, it constructs a new syntax, uh, a string literal as syntax at runtime. And the value of the string literal will, of course, be in angle brackets, the uh, textual value of the element we captured on the left-hand side. So you can see uh, we can actually use arbitrary lean code on the right-hand side to construct a new syntax to give it the sugaring of our, um, of our introduced syntax. And of course, this will also be get a bit more complicated in the more general case when we have children. So again, I won't uh, go over all the details, but at least you can see that the very first thing we're doing here is to check if the uh, opening and closing tag actually match. And if they do not, then here we are actually throwing the exception we've seen before, um, which will be um, uh, which will be reported at the location of the syntax uh, subterm M, which is the closing tag, um, also as we've seen. And otherwise, if they do match, we do some uh, recursive. Um, matching of the of all the children translation and in the end we're building um, we're building a term that at runtime will concatenate all these single parts and instead of looking at the implementation we can also quickly easily see that if we change the eval statement to a check statement now you can see on the right hand side the actual core term that is produced after expansion and yeah, you can see that there are many string literals that we've created uh, in, the, in our macros as well as uh, the concatenations and the placeholders. Okay, um, so much for um, a very simple term, um, term based uh, demo of a DSL. So you might think that's still a bit of a weird demo since uh, Lean is not a web language, right? Um, what do we have a uh, use uh, for, for HTML? So I'd say, well, let's make it a web language, right? Can't be that hard. Um, so what I've done is uh, I've implemented a most basic, simple web HTTP server in a web server namespace somewhere above. And we're simply opening that here, not worrying about the actual implementation. And then we're um, again um, declaring a very simple DSL on top of that. And in the end, we will create, uh, declare a new macro in the uh, built-in command, um, command syntax category, which is the thing that you write on the top level in Lean, like def or open and so on. Uh, in contrast to terms. And macro is simply a, um, is a combination of a syntax declaration and a single macro rule declaration in a single, um, uh, in a single command. Okay, so again, not worrying much about the actual implementation. What can we do with this new command? Well, we can write something like, okay, um, 
Um, here's an action we can do. Uh, here's a HTTP handler that says, when you see an HTTP GET request for the, uh, for the root path, then execute the action on the right. And the right-hand side really is just an arbitrary lean term again that is some, in some uh, monad for, um, for, yeah, for handling HTTP requests. And here, um, we're just uh, executing a monadic action that will redirect the user to a different URL. So what does that URL does, uh, do? That's uh, in the handler below. So we're again matching against a literal part of the URL, but then we're also using a uh, placeholder here to uh, capture the rest of the URL in the variable name. So that will actually behave, that is a, a regular lean variable that we can then use on the right-hand side to say, um, construct some output using our previous DSL for writing a nice and tidy HTML output. Um, so these two DSLs are completely orthogonal. One is on the lean term level and one is on the lean command level and they know nothing about each other. But yeah, it is very simple to, um, to just um, mix and match them um, as we want. Okay, so what will we do with this? Um, in the end, we're declaring a, a regular main uh, function in Lean of, uh, in the IO monad, and we're simply taking the um, standard in and the standard out of the process, and then uh, running the web server um, using those, um, using the implementation I've written um, before. Um, so we're not worrying about sucker programming or anything like this. We don't have any API for something specific like that yet. So let's just use um, uh, some the, the string standard in and standard out. And oops, um, um, yeah, okay. And so in the end, let's try to run this, right? So I've uh, started a terminal here. You can see um, that this directory contains a single lean file, which is our file above. And so we can simply execute lean make bin to, um, to compile this uh, lean file into a binary. So it's first extracting the C code, then compiling the C code, actually using Clang, and then finally linking it into a single binary that we can find in the build bin directory and execute. Well, executing is, is not very interesting on the command line and least unless we want to write HTTP requests by hand. So let's not do that and use our old friend uh, netcat instead. So we'll uh, listen on port 1234 and then uh, using some dark uh, bash magic I found on Stack Overflow connected to our web server binary um, we just compiled. All right, so we'll start this. Nothing happens, that's good. Um, now I try to um, switch to a browser. Do I just have to stop the sharing, I guess? Is that the most efficient way? Well, I guess it works at least. Okay, so now you can see my browser. Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, so we go to localhost 1234. We immediately uh, redirect it to uh, slash create slash stranger and being created accordingly. So yeah, we're now actually talking with a lean binary in, uh, yeah, we just compiled uh, from our DSL and other parts. And this website, of course, is not very dynamic. Um, exactly, and not much to do there, but we can at least like uh, adjust the URL to say um, give a more according um, appropriate greeting. Okay, um, I think at this point we're also um, slightly over our um, time, so yeah, I think. Like I could show a bit more of the actual macro we defined, but I think at 
this point, yeah, we can just take any questions you have, or, right? So, so how, how should we ask questions? Just unmute and free for all, or? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess, um, sorry, uh, Cody, Draper Labs, um, hi, Leo, and nice hi, to Hi, Cody. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, yeah. Um, what's, what, what are the big next steps for Lean 4 uh, that you anticipate? Oh, uh, the first thing we, we want to release by the end of the summer, uh, I mean, it's publicly available, but uh, we're still finishing the new front end. And, uh, and after that, uh, one thing that Sebastian and I have been talking about is uh, making the compiler more powerful. We, want, we have many ideas on how to improve the, the compiler, for instance, allowing uh, users to use lemmas they have proved as we're writing rules in the compiler. Uh, we want to adapt the attached framework for allowing interactive compilation for users. Uh, okay. Yeah, we have many ideas on how to improve the compiler. Okay. Um, when you say use lemmas as rules, you mean, um, you know, operational rules? Well, uh, one simple thing is like the, the map of a map is a map of the function composition, right? So for that you prove that, you okay. tell the compiler, use it to optimize I... codes. No? Okay. Um, all these sound kind of programming language-y. Um, is, uh, I mean, I, I assume the intent is to support all the proof stuff that's supported in Lean 3. Yes. As yes. well. Okay. Yes. Yeah, we, we have a patch framework already in Lean 4. Uh, we will add, uh, there's a few major tactics that are missing, like uh, the simplifier. Uh, we will add it, but uh, you have to keep in mind the system is much more extensible now. Uh, users can, can, can extend, add their own tactics, uh, it's much easier. And you don't pay a price. In Lean 3, when you implement your own tactic in Lean, it's interpreted. Now it will be compiled. Uh, it's much easier to extend the system. Right? Uh, the community, keep in mind, this Lean 3, the community more or less took over. Right? They, they do all the maintenance, they, their own extensions. In Lean 4, they can do that without having to have their own version of the binary. Right? Uh, one of the main motivations for us is to have Lean 4 extensible is like, uh, people can tweak the system, change, extend without uh, having to have their own distribution, right? They can do it and pack as plugins and they can plug and play and, and have the, their dream proof assistant, right? Uh, we're using these building blocks. Okay. Um, I'm going to open the floor because if I keep asking questions, uh, I'll be the whole okay. Um or I can read the questions that I'm seeing flying by on the uh, chat, but um, maybe, maybe uh, Sebastian should do that. He's been doing good so far. Okay, yeah, I haven't seen the, um, the chat while I was sharing the screen. So um, yeah, should we just start from the chat? Uh, yeah, I saw one from Koji about how do you handle non-linearity in the syntax forms? <laughs> yeah, yeah um, but you, since, uh, since I asked that question, I think uh, the, the answer is you don't. And then later on, you need to check that, you know, the opening and the closing are equal. Right, yes. Um, yeah, so I think that's also the right choice because if you had nonlinear patterns, then of course the question always is what does equality exactly mean here? When are two syntax tree equal and will match the same thing, will unify? And yeah, I think that can very much um, um, change depending on your context. So I think this is should, something you should uh, define yourself as a user. Okay. There's another question here, Sebastian. I don't know what it means. In the filter predicates, you use it at the 
if they expanded form, could you reduce it? I don't remember seeing a filter predicate. Um, Did you have something like that in the demo? Uh, yeah, Something I think it, it was Sebastian when he was defining um, the uh, the forms for uh, for the text for parsing bits of text. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, so, I mean, so I can go back to show you my screen. Let's see. Or uh, yeah, if if you're if you're the one that asked this question, um, also free feel to join in. Um, okay, so inside the text block. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm doing very many low level things here. Um, so was it about the filter predicate um, that I'm using to um, to parse the text? Uh, where, where was the question again? Oh, yeah, I can't see it without stop, stopping to share my screen. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. So uh, now I can't see the question anymore. Yeah, so it's th this part yeah, this particular take while was the question. Uh, the the lambda, it seems like you could just you know use the composition and not actually doing the the lambda. Oh yeah yeah. Um, so let's just say this is not a preferred style at least of ours. We're using in the lean code base. Um, I'm pretty sure it will not work right. Oh yeah yeah it might actually work. So I wasn't sure if the actual operator was um, supported um, in the new front end. Uh, yeah, works. Okay. Yeah, I asked. Yeah, I was curious if you have this. Yeah, so it seems to work. Yeah, yeah. I just wasn't sure if the actual syntax of the operator was defined in the new front end, but it seems to work all right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let's see. Support for homotopy types? No, we don't have plans to support homotopy types in Lean 4. Uh, Lean 2 has support for homotopy type theory, but in Lean 3, we, we remove it. Uh, Gabriel has some extensions for allowing people to use homo, to, 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 to work on homotopy, homotopy type theory in Lean 3. Uh, but yeah, we, we don't have plans to support uh, homotopy type tuning link for. Uh, see another question is, does custom syntax also support interactive editor features like auto-completion? Yeah, we, we didn't work on, on the, actually that's something that we are just starting writing, uh, write, writing language servers for link for. Uh, we have a very simple Emacs mode for link for. Uh, yeah, yeah, we are completely writing Lean 4 without auto completion, which uh, yes. is an experience. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I think we can say this is definitely the goal, right? Like when we get auto completion to work with, for the standard Lean syntax, that should work in some um, general enough way that you can also do that for your very own DSL inside of Lean. Uh, Gabriel just posted the link to the Lean Tree Homotope Type Theory version. Uh, one thing that keep in mind that this kind of, of extension that Gabriel wrote is much easier to do in Lean Four, right? So, uh, I think he covered all the questions I found here on the chat. Yeah. So so now I get to ask more. <laughs> is there is there a story? For consistency, um, that's that's anything but you know the kernel is always consistent unless you add new rules to the conversion check or axioms. Is there any doubt? Uh, is there any question about the consistency? Basically, that's different from Wing Three. No, the story is pretty similar, right? Uh, you you can still write uh, external type checkers. Uh, there's a question here, someone asking about the, if you want to have it, uh, the ability to export. Actually, it's much easier in Lean 4 because all the structures in Lean are implemented in Lean itself. 
You can write your own exporter if you want, because you can traverse everything. You can traverse the environment, you can traverse the syntax, you can traverse all these data structures used to represent syntax, expressions, declarations, definitions, everything is available, right? The users can write link code to traverse them, they are indexed data types, uh, and, and you can do whatever you want with them. You can explore, you write your own formats. Uh, if you want, you can write your own type checking link itself. Uh, yeah, you, you can, they're all, uh, I, I this a, it, it sounds a little scary. So this is something I've never really understood. It sounds like you, you have this completely homo. Ho, um, I don't know how to say that word. Homoenic, homoenic language. Homoetonic language, mm -hmm. but but it still needs to be consistent. So is that just there's some some layers here that that like not everything can introspect its own syntax. So definitely okay. that's that's inconsistent. No, you have a type, uh, remember, uh, keep in mind that when you write a type checker in Lean itself, uh, a full type checker, for instance, we, we do things like that. Uh, we are going to use features like partial, right? Keep in mind that partial uses this combination of unsafe if implemented by, you are, at that point, you are really using Lean as a programming language. This is going to be an opaque definition that you cannot prove anything about, right? Okay. Okay, so that's that's the trick. There's programming lean that's completely opaque and has no yes. relationship to proofs. No, not, not, not completely. I mean, there are programs in lean that you can reason about, right? If you don't use partial, it's right, a standard right, right, right. lean. If, right. There's okay. a question about yes. package manager in lean 4, Sebastian. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, we definitely don't have one right now. And I'd also say that the story is gotten a bit more complicated in Lean 4 because, um, well, in Lean 3 it was very simple because Lean was its own system with its own language, its own compiler, um, not that it compiled very much. Um, but yeah, now we are actually in also interfacing with uh, a C compiler that has to come from somewhere and we could also very likely imagine um, linking against some other libraries that are not from Lean or even maybe, I don't know, uh, automatically generating some code and stuff. So it seems like at least the build part is getting much more complicated. So right now we are simply using Make or a, a Make wrapper. You've seen um, in, in my demo this Lean Make um, for yeah, the simple most um, approach. But yeah, we're not actually doing any package management like uh, downloading dependencies or automatically building um, them and so on. Um, yeah, I mean, would be great if, if someone um, um, <laughs> wrote something like that in the end and we will need something like that. Right now we don't have anything. Um, I think there was also this one project of someone um, who I've never met um, working on a Lean4 package manager. I'm not uh, sure what's the status of that one. Um, personally, um, to be honest, I'd be most interested in just reusing Nix for its completely reusable uh, builds story and like, you know, um, um, caching uh, across, the, across the cloud and so on, which other people are doing in Lean 3 using very special scripts, but I'd much rather have a general build system that already does that. But yeah, so at least for me, it's not quite clear here yet what direction we should take. There's a question from Mario asking the TCB for verified programs in Lean. Uh, yeah, it's, it increases quite a bit. Uh, basically, we have to trust the compiler that is not as small. Uh, it's not small at all, right? Right now the compiler, some parts are still written in C, right? Eventually the com full compiler is going to be implemented in, in, in Lean, right? Some parts of the compiler are already implemented in Lean, but they are not, we don't prove anything about them. Uh, we'll, it's not in our, we don't plan to verify things about the compiler. 
I think if someone wants to have to reduce the trust code base for verified lean programs, they can write in the future their own compiler. They may try to verify our compiler. That is going to be a, quite a challenge. Uh, uh, one related feature we have is like we have support for proofs by reflection. Uh, we didn't talk about that. Uh, we, uh, you can uh, invoke, you can, in the type checker, users can decide to support that you implement a decision procedure, you prove it's correct, and you, use the, you, you want to use the type checker, the compiled version, right? Uh, this is a feature that many users ask it. Uh, we added support for that in Lean 4, but automatically when you use this feature, you're increasing a lot the trusted code base. You are putting the whole compiler there. Uh, another thing that you're giving up when you use this feature is the ability to use external type checkers because they are not going to have this efficient compilation for executing the, 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 your decision, verifies the decision procedure. Uh, yeah, and yeah. I think um, specifically for the unsafe and partial um, part, um, yeah, I think what someone should write really is, uh, is a static analyzer that tells you what um, yeah, unsafe parts here are actually safe code is, uh, is depending on just like when you're proving Ethereum, it, you should actually look at what axioms it's using to make sure um, the theorem statement is actually correct. Myron is asking now again, what the external type checkers see when uh, terms when you use reflection. Well, you're going to see, uh, it's going to be approved by raffle, right? So you're going to have EQ raffle there. Uh, the only problem that the external type checker is going to try to use some reduction engine that is way slower than the code that generated by our compiler, right? Uh, I think that's the problem that the external type checker, in practice, it can type check, but it will take forever, right? And so this feature of using uh, compiled code to verify a decision procedure, compile it in C and use it to type check, this feature is for people that don't really care about a minimalistic TCB or the ability of using external type checkers. But we have users that, that are like that, for instance. Uh, one example is this IMO grant challenge. Uh, Daniel is going to use this feature for writing but, custom decision procedures. Okay, but, but there is a dream here somewhere, right? That you could bootstrap your trusted code base to then have you know, a verified compiler, and then that's yes. trusted, and then you use the trusted compiler to compile yes. your yes. verified this is a dream. This is not my dream, but yes, there is this dream. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're you're doing you're doing verification, right? I mean, I don't know. At some point, you know, you, you have to you have to trust that this is at least possible. Yes, no, I trust it's possible. I just want, don't want, I don't want to invest my, the rest of my life for this dream. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> but you'd be happy if somebody else did it, right? Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. I have a, a clarification question. Um, oh, sorry, it's uh, Juliet speaking, Northeastern University. So the, if I use safe but not partial, is it possible to prove anything about unsafe code? So maybe it's like some hard function, but maybe I want to prove some simple property that it somehow corresponds to the safe version I used in the proof. No, no. We, when you use unsafe, uh, you, you can't really prove anything at this point. Uh, as I mentioned, one trick people can try to use is uh, the code, the, the Lean expression for unsafe function is in the environment, right? You can try to write a meta program that traverses this expression and try to construct automatically a safe version of it that we will be able to reason about. Mm -hmm. But, uh, okay, at least the code that I write uh, unsafe in is type checked in. Well, yeah, type check modulo, uh, for instance, you will not check for termination. You're going to be using other unsafe features there. You may use other unsafe features that will to, 
bytes assume they they they, uh, they are from inhabited types, right? Uh, yes, okay. there is some minimal checking happening when you're mm -hmm. using safe. Well, I mean, it's it's Haskell safe, right? It's just not. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yes, it's a good analogy. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Yes. Any ones we missed? Uh, there's a uh, the big difference in type. Oh, they are asking about the type class inference. Yes, it's <laughs> a completely new algorithm. Uh, it's, uh, it can handle diamonds, can handle cycles. Uh, in, in the Lean websites, we have uh, uh, a link to the, a paper describing in archive. Uh, uh, it's uh, in the source code for the new type class uh, resolution procedure is written in Lean. Uh, in, is in our code base. Uh, we can add a link. Uh, yeah, maybe yeah. I will update our website with a link to the actual implementation. But uh, we have a paper there describing the new algorithm for type class inference. Yeah, it's, it's much more efficient and addresses many problems in performance problems in the existing type class inference in link tree. Yeah. So for, yeah, there's another question asking. Lean doesn't support canonical structures. How does it deal with term size blow up needed for type classes? Uh, this type size blow up it doesn't happen. It's not as big of a problem. Uh, uh, one, the type class hierarchy in MathLib is huge, right? Uh, they had a few problems with that, but this is. I think one of the main reasons is that this partial bundles, uh, fully bundled approach, uh, the term size blow up happens a lot when you use the fully unbundled approach where you have many, many parameters, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few instances of that in MathLib, but most of the time they don't use this approach. Right? And so the term size blow up is not uh, uh, a big problem in Lean 3 nor Lean 4, right? Mm -hmm. um. Ah, is that all? Well, well uh, Coach is asking if there's a project for porting MathLib to. MathLib to uh, from Link Three, I, I guess to Link Four, right? Yeah, and uh, I think this was well, was Paolo's question about compatibility. I assume between Link Three and Four and uh, beyond. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Well, uh, Gabriel wrote uh, a tool that converts the uh, is not converting the library automatically, but converting the the binary representation of the library. He exports the Link Three, right? He creates uh, exports objects. He reads this thing in Lean 4. Uh, you could see that this kind of compatibility is like when you have a shared library that you compiled using Rust and you want to use this shared library in C. It's like a black box, but all your theorems, everything is there, but this, you lost uh, things like the, uh, the uh, custom syntax, right? Okay, but, but in the long term, uh, you, you actually do want those things. You yeah, but it depends. I, I, I can, I can, uh, depends on the community, right? If people, the MathLib developers want to write uh, a version of MathLib to Lean 4, yes, it will happen. If they don't, uh, uh, the best we can do is provide tools that help people to port uh, code from Lean 3 to Lean 4. I mean, th this is the question we've been dancing around a little bit, but but is the hope that people right now that are using Lean 3 will all migrate to Lean 4? 
or or is that not necessarily the 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 idea? Could you repeat, uh, Koti? Uh, okay, I'll show my video. That might help. Um, okay. Is the hope that that people using Lean, Lean Three right now will be using Lean Four, you know, next year or, or whatever? Yeah. And so, so how how do you port everything? Well, we, as I said, uh, uh, it's going to be a huge effort, right, to port. I mean, we can provide tools that help. For instance, the parser is extensible. You can write a Lean Three parser in Lean Four, and this is going to produce a syntax object, and you can traverse the syntax objects and make the adjustments of the syntax and export Lean Four. Uh, we we actually did that. For instance, we changed the syntax while developing Lean Four. We changed the Lean Four syntax. And we use exactly that. We kept the old syntax, the new syntax, and we write a, a, a code for to convert the syntax objects to the new version. Everything was done automatically. We use that from time to time. Okay. And we make a juice. Okay. So the hope is that this is a tool like this or extensions of this tool will be used to convert all of Lean 3, you know, existing work yes. into Lean 4, and then everybody moves over to Lean 4. Yes. Well, at least what we hope that 99% of the work can be done automatically. 1% uh, of something huge as MathLib is still a lot, right? But you're going to probably have to do some fine tuning yourself, right? Okay. Um, so how much of the, um, the, so I guess as far as when, when, uh, MathLib would be ready to, to start working on the porting would depend on how much of, uh, let's say the tactic framework and these sorts of basic techniques. I mean, uh, I, I, I definitely understand that, that it's designed to be very extensible and that uh, users, um, especially power users, will be able to write uh, tactics to, uh, to sort of compensate for anything that's currently missing uh, in Lean 4, which means that you can probably uh, release it earlier than you otherwise would be able to if it weren't so extensible. Um, yes. But uh, the I guess the problem is that the the less you provide, the the more expertise you require of the people who are writing those tactics, and so the smaller number of people who can actually jump in and do that work, uh, which means that you know the the actual uh, the porting work becomes much much uh, much harder. So I guess m my question to you would be. How how long do you think it would be before you have something where you think that um, that it would be ready for for the the MathLib community people to to jump in and finish the job? Well, we think in the end of the summer we can have the bare bones system, right? Uh, people can use Lean, can start using Lean, the new front ends. Uh, but with limited number of tactics, we have already tactics, the basic tactics like intro, assumption, induction, cases, injection, all these this basic tactics we, we already have. But there are big ones missing like SIMP, right? And we want the new SIMP to have support for AC here writing. We have many ideas on how to improve it. Uh, uh, and this is going to take a, uh, to have a richer tactic framework. Uh, it will take a, a extra few months. Do, do you think that community people are, do you, do you think that we should be writing that, that simp tactic? Or do you think that that's something that, that should be done uh, in collaboration? Or are you planning to do it and then release it when it's done? Like, what, where do you see the, the division? Well, uh, 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 keep in mind, we are making sure the system is fully extensible, right? We don't want to, we want to people, if they have a, a ideas, the community has ideas on how to write a better simp, right? They can do it, right? Uh, 
maybe the simple way I want to write is we will not fulfill all the needs of the community, right? We, for sure, we want to fill the, the needs of users like Daniel Selson, right? He's at Microsoft, he's building this system for solving IMO problems. He has some specific requirements. We want to fulfill his requirements, right? Uh, well, but the community, well, there, there, there are so many users. Each user wants something else, right? Uh, math, like the main requirement is that it acts mostly like the old sim, right? Um, yes. And the less breakage, you know, the, the more exactly you can match all of the funny side case behaviors of SIMP, the better it will uh, be able to, to make the porting effort. Um, but I know that going all the way there is, is going to be very difficult. Because yeah, I believe just... that for, for a project the size of MathLib, it would actually make sense if someone re-implemented the lean free SIMP completely separately. Um, as, as close as possible in the for simply for porting old code. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yes. I don't think that has to have much or any um, thing to do with the, the lead for sim we will want to write um, that hopefully will be used in MathLib in some future, um, future release or maybe so, in so say new files. So, so that would be Porting C plus plus to Lean essentially, which I guess you've yeah. got a lot of experience in. How, how <laughs> difficult do you think uh, that that sort of like just taking a, a large component of, of the current Lean three kernel and, and or not kernel but the Lean three implementation and just rewriting it in Lean four? Uh, yeah, and I mean, simply isn't even that big of a tactic, yes. right? Yeah, I think it would be very feasible to just try and port that one-to-one to lean for. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think, we, I we think bought Paolo, some lots of co Okay. Sorry, I think I think Paolo had a had a, another question, um, which might be a little bit tongue in cheek, uh, but I, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I saw the question is the if we plan to stabilize now and keep compatibility from now on. Yeah, for sure. I mean, but we probably said the same thing for Link Three. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of the crazy thing what happened with Link Three is we actually stopped developing it when we switched to Link Four, so it became much more stable, and then the community took over and um, adjusted it to their to MathLib's um, specific. Um, um, needs and then it didn't get yeah um then i think they well, they didn't break compatibility compatibility all that much but so basically the lean users actually continued breaking compatibility so yeah if it doesn't work out for lean 3 at the moment i'm not seeing lean 4 being completely stable very soon right i mean if i may elaborate the your FAQ says, well, this is a research project, this is not really supported or things like that, which is a good idea because, well, if you are upfront about your plans, but so my plan is, and I guess many other people, well, when they change their, uh, their policies, it's maybe time to start using it seriously. Um, and I guess is, well, what do you think will happen, or what do you hope that Link Four would be the real thing, and then you can keep things more compatible, or you might need uh, some other invasive changes? So, well, uh, one thing to keep in mind is like, was a huge was. Took us way longer than we expected to develop Link 4, right? It was much harder. I, I doubt Sebastian and I have the energy to start from scratch again, a Link 5. Uh, uh, we both have a lot of fun programming Link. I, I think we want to keep programming the system in Link itself. Uh, we may adjust something, but if we adjust something after we release Link 4, 
one new capability we have is performing this kind of automatic refactoring where you can parse our parser. And we just mentioned that about our parser uh, preserves all the information, the comments, everything. Mm -hmm. You can change the syntax, apply syntax transformation and generate a new file where you preserve the comments, everything. And we use that when we, we have used that already to, to automatically update our code base when we change the lean syntax. So lean mm -hmm. four now has the capability that lean three would really like to have. Yeah, we, we hope that's true for, for <laughs> many uh, features. So, so the why would translation switch? to lean five will be much easier than the translation from Lean 3 to Lean 4. Well, uh, I mean, okay, you're saying Lean 5, but we are not going to start a, a code base from scratch, right? Uh, it's, it's a lot of work, I mean, especially now. I mean, if there is a Lean 5, it's just because we bumped the version number, but we're still based on the same code base. Mm-hmm. Sounds promising. Great, thanks. Okay. I think we're way over time. And mm -hmm. there don't seem to be many more questions or any. So shall we call this a wrap? Yes, yes. Thanks everybody for staying for almost two hours. Uh, yeah, thanks. It's been fun. <laughs> <laughs>